Hello everyone, my name is Ilya Kapitan. I'm a postdoc at Kavlia PMD in Japan. And uh, today I want to show you the first measurement of the quasar lifetime distribution that we obtained. Um, just a quick, remi quick reminder, quasar lifetime is the time scale of single episodes of accretion of uh, supermassive black holes in power quasars. Um, we use the extent of the so-called helium proximity zones to, to measure it. Uh, helium to proximity zone size is dependent on the quasar lifetime simply because the longer quasar shines, the larger is this region of ionized helium around them. So the only remaining question is what is the size, how to define it? For that, we use the definition by Fan et al. 2006, which is when the properly smooth transmission profile drops below 10% for the first time. Uh, I should also briefly say a few words about the terminology. I'm going to be talking about two time scales in, in, this, in this talk. First is the desired quasar lifetime, TQ, and the second one is the quasar on time, T on, which is actually what uh, what you measure, what, what you get from the measurement of the uh, quasar proximity zones, simply because um, the size that you infer from observing the, the quasar proximity zones can be uh, larger in the future if you observe the same quasar um, at later times because quasar might shine longer. And so you actually get the lower limit on the quasar lifetime. So keep it in mind. Uh, so recently we uh, investigated 20 helium-2 transparent quasars at redshift three to four. This, ta uh, this table summarizes the main properties of, of our sample. And the uh, two columns on the right shows you the measured proximity zone sizes with error and the inferred individual quasar on times. But uh, Gabor Worsak will talk more about this. I will concentrate on inferring the underlying distribution of quasar lifetime. For that, we use a combination of hydrodynamical simulations and one-dimensional radiative transfer. And uh, this uh, animation shows you how the uh, helium-2 transmission spectra, spectrum depends on the quasar on time or quasar lifetime. So in general, the proximity zone side depends on three parameters listed here uh, in the bottom. Quasar on time, the helium-2 ionizing background, which sets the initial helium-2 fraction, and the quasar luminosity, which we can fix from observations. And so for each quasar in our uh, sample, we get the 410 models, um, uh, which contain 1,000 skewers, a line of sites uh, per model. If we measure the sizes along each of the skewer, uh, we can get the distribution, which is shown here on this plot by the black histogram. The red is the Gaussian fit to this histogram, and the blue line is the position of the, is, is the size of the observed protein result for a particular quasar, just for reference. So how do we, how can we infer the quasar lifetime distribution from the individual measurements? Uh, so that, that's what we do. Let's assume you have uh, some form of quasar lifetime distribution. We assume a log normal distribution, which is uh, characterized by the mean and the sigma. The plot shows you the example of su uh, such a distribution. So we define, uh, define a parameter grid, which is listed here in the bottom of this panel. And now for each, uh, combination of these parameters, we need to create the Bayesian likelihood in order to run the MCMC analysis later and to uh, infer this um, mean and sigma of the distribution. So how do we do it? So let's say we have a crazy lifetime distribution with the mean and sigma. First, we sample this lifetime distribution. We draw a thousand uh, log TQ values from it, this uh, red dots on the plot. Now, remember that the proximity zone measurements and simulations also, they, they give you the, uh, the values of the quasar on times, not the lifetimes. So we need to also sample the lifetimes, uh, remembering that the quasar on time is uniformly distributed from zero to uh, TQ linearly. So we get 2000 T on times for these two parameters. Now you remember that uh, the extent of the quasar proximity zones also depend on the under underlying helium-2 fraction, the initial helium-2 fraction. Uh, we draw 10,000 helium-2 fractions uh, from simulations of Davis et al. 2017 model at the redshift of each quasar, of, of quasar in question. So we have 10,000 pairs of quasar on times and helium-2 fraction. For this, for each of this combination, in our simulations, we find the corresponding distribution of the proximity zone sizes, and we draw 
500 values of the proximity zone sizes from each of these distribution. We join them in one combined uh, distribution of the proximity zone sizes that correspond to the uh, realization of the quasar lifetime distribution. We fit this uh, distribution with KDE and evaluate it at the uh, size of the observed proximity zone size of the quasar equation. So we repeat the same combination for eight, uh, sorry, we repeat these steps for each combination of the parameters of the quasar lifetime distribution and get the uh, almost thousand likelihood values per quasar. We combine them in the joint likelihood just by summing the likelihoods of each individual quasar. And then we can sample it now with MCMC. We do this and we get these results. Uh, the left triangle plot shows you the standard deviation and the mean of the quasar lifetime distribution, which are beautifully um, constrained. And the right panel shows you the 100 realizations from the MCMC samples. And the black curve is the median of these samples. So this is, uh, I think, the first time somebody's, uh, somebody's uh, measured the underlying distribution of quasar lifetimes, which now makes it possible to do a more sophisticated modeling of the quasar light curves, and uh, it will help to understand the formation mechanism of the supermassive black holes. Uh, but we can do a little bit more, and we can actually go back from the distribution of lifetimes to the distribution of on times. We found the analytical solution, which the, uh, the analytical equation that helps us to translate the distribution of lifetimes to the distribution of on times, which is shown here in the top panel by the uh, red, red curve, which corresponds to the median here, to the, this black curve here. And uh, we also have a hundred realizations. The, uh, bottom and the middle panel show you, show, show you the individual on-time measurements uh, from global war six. So, so now uh, one question that uh, other researchers ask is what is the probability of finding the so-called extremely young quasars that, uh, with quasar on time less than 100,000 uh, years? So Christina Eilers, for example, in, the, in their recent paper, they found uh, this to be the probability is to be five to 10% from observing, uh, I think, 150 quasars. So we can translate this PDF to the CDF and, and estimate the, say, the same number, and we get 10% plus minus uh, a few percent. So this is extremely close to the observed value. And it looks like we can explain why uh, this value is observed just by using our analytical expression. So I guess I'm out of time and uh, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, find me uh, online, send me an email uh, and I'll give you more details about this.